the title for this talk, in case anybody is not aware, is Achieving the Impossible, Historical Precedents for Global Systemic School Reform. So those of you who may have attended Peter Gray's talk or be familiar with some posts he made in many years ago is that he does not believe reform is possible, only a revolution from the outside. I disagree, and this is why this talk is here. I'm going to say that there's evidence for optimism. There's evidence and other processes we can look at that can encourage us and, and, and enable us to think about school reform strategically uh, moving forward. So my name is Don Berg. I am a psychologist. I homeschooled other people's kids for about five years. That was my entree into actual practice uh, in the late 90s. Didn't work out a sustainable business model. Started and crashed the business several times. Um, and the, the idea was a consensus-based small group exploring the community on a daily basis. So um, it wasn't until 2004, which I believe was the Vancouver, British Columbia IDEC. No. That was my, no. Okay, we're, we're, whenever the Vancouver, because I know I was in Vancouver, I don't know what Okay. That was 2008, I think. Okay, well, anyway. It couldn't have been 2008. Well, I guess it could have been. Anyway, Vancouver IDEC was my first. And I had no idea this world existed. I just went, wow. <laughs> Over the last, eight of the last 10 years, I was an, an environmental activist. I was the co-founder and treasurer of a, a group working on air pollution in Portland, Oregon. Uh, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, so the talk, the historical precedents that I'll be referring to are of four, four types. Um, there's this idea of what's called an adjacent possible, which I'll explain later. Um, number two is market transformations. There are ways that markets transform, and education is a form of market, and it's not, I am not talking about privatization. Not what I'm talking about. Different kind of market. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, conceptual shift. So ways that actual human brains change, and that's uh, you know my field is psychology. Uh, and then the fourth piece is a, is going to be a relatively short piece, but it's looking at um, who are the change agents that bring about these kinds of, of transformations and changes and reform. All right. So unfortunately, the contrast effect makes this very difficult for you to see. But um, there's a woman right here. This is my colleague, Jen. So when we were, um, when I was, Portland Clean Air was the name of the organization where we were fighting air pollution in Portland, Oregon, in the USA. And this is my colleague. She was the one who chiefly went out and down the street, she would come, she would have a clipboard and she would walk up to you on the street and say, do you have a moment to talk about air pollution? And then we, a conversation would ensue. Now, these are other examples of canvases I found randomly on the internet, uh, except for this one is actually a colleague of mine as well from a prior campaign, but that's another issue. Um, so when that happens, oh, and, and we had lunch in Paris because we were transferring, transferring from train to train, and uh, there were canvassers outside the Paris train station. So I know it, it, it's not a U.S. phenomenon. There are canvassers in, in other countries. I don't know if yours has it, but it's a lot in America, and particularly in Oregon, because we have a process called the initiative process, where just a citizen can say, this should be a law, and they can get it on the ballot, um, and it can be, become law. Um, so when Jen does that, the conversation can proceed immediately, and within five minutes, she can ask for a donation, and people will say yes, and some people will say no, but within five minutes, she can ask for that donation, and it makes sense. She, if you were to do the same thing and say, do you have a moment to talk about democratic education? The only place you'll actually have an immediate conversation is here. <laughs> Everywhere else in the world, you have to explain for at least 10 minutes, and then they still may not understand, and you're certainly not going to get a donation. So this is what I call, oh, I thought I named it before that. I call it the canvassing problem. 
Canvassing is what we call the that process of, of interacting with people on that tonight. And I actually made my living for a time going door to door asking for money. And I did that for an organization that protects the local mountain, a, a national forest. So, so I know what that process is, and, and then I started an organization that also did that. Okay, so the canvassing problem, let me give you, if I was talking to the general public, rather than y'all, because um, a lot of you who have tried to promote democratic education in the world already know kind of the, the, the concept I'm about to illustrate. Okay. Does anybody recognize what, besides Joyce, recognize this? It's a computer game from the 80s. Anybody? Okay. I suspected not. It's called the Oregon Trail. I live in Oregon. The Oregon Trail in 1848 was a trail from Missouri in the middle of America out to Oregon. It's a 1,200 mile journey. And people were making that journey in covered wagons they would, uh, an ox-drawn wagon, uh, they had literally their entire life packed into the wagon, and they were heading out to Oregon to have a new life. Now, every day they would have to, you know, they were walking alongside the oxen, so most people didn't, couldn't afford horses to ride along with them, despite what Hollywood might make you think. Um, they were just walking every day, they had animals, they had to stop every day, they had to feed themselves, no infrastructure along this trail. It's, it, it literally isn't really a road, it's just two tracks that happen because people keep going on it, it made tracks. And there's places where the tracks are still visible in the rocks because so many people, hundreds of thousands of people, used these wagons and made ruts in rocks. That's how many people made this journey. The journey is quite hazardous at that time, in 1848. Trouble with their sound system. Um, so in 1848, there were, uh, you know, disease could kill you, um, hostile people, Native Americans, um, animals could kill you, um, disease, let's see what else, ill preparedness. Um, you know, if, if you did not take the right supplies, if you did not, you know, take care of your animals well enough, and you break down, there's, there's nobody to save you out there. Um, so it's a very hazardous journey. The uh, chances of dying were one in ten. Okay? Yet hundreds of thousands of people made that journey. So it's very interesting. Now, imagine we're in Independence, Missouri in, on April 1st, 1848, and a canvasser magically appears in front of you. And he says, you know what? I got access to this thing. It's called an airplane. An airplane can get you all the way to Oregon in one day. Not three months. One day. And it'll decrease your odds of dying to less than one in a thousand. Okay? There he has a brochure for an airplane. And that's a... a the Oregon Ducks is a team, so it's actually the Oregon plane there. They have the livery in, in Oregon color. The university colors for the football team. Anyway, um, so I make this proposal. As a psychologist, I already know what the answer will be most of the time. Overwhelming majority of people will stick to their wagon. That's not a question. That's not, that's not in question. That's a fact. People who go with the familiar. It's a thing they know. Yeah, sure. You, this weird thing you call an airplane, I don't know what that is. It's unknown. They have no idea. They will stick to the wagons. There will be a few radicals and you know, they'll get blown out. Oh, I forgot to mention that the one thing about the airplane is that we have no idea when, in the next four months, it's going to show up and take you. It'll take you at some unknown time. So it's not like you have the option now. It's like, well, it's going to happen eventually. So you'd have to also anticipate the fact that you'd wait around for an unknown amount of time, and then you either will come or not. Okay. So we know, that this is the, the, I think, yeah, this is the canvassing problem in another guise. Most of the people in the world today are on the wagon train, and we're offering them an airplane. 
It doesn't, you know, okay, great, but here's the 10% <laughs> that are choosing it. Um, so how do we get over that? That's actually what, what a global systemic change towards something we might recognize as democratic education has to overcome the canvassing problem. Okay. <laughs> that was the answer. <laughs> so now I have a pictured here a space rocket, the internet, an iPhone, and a human organ for transplant. All of these things at some point in the past were literally impossible and inconceivable. Every one of these things. Yet, today they're, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Big deal. So I'm going to put together a, a way of thinking about how these came about. It starts from an actual now. But that's not now now, that's a, that's a time at which it was impossible. And then after that we'll look at, there's a thing called an adjacent possible. Hello little one. <laughs> that must be a lovely picture. Um, adjacent possible is, is a concept of uh, change theorists thought about, you can go over there? Okay. You can go ahead. Enjoy. <laughs> um, so when thinking about change, I ran into this in Stephen Johnson's, one of Stephen Johnson's books. And he said, um, the adjacent possible, there, there's, we have a now moment. The now moment is actually completely constrained. There's nothing we can do about now. However, the next moment is a little less constrained. And the moment after that is a little less constrained. And so you can go out. So the constrained now moment gives us only certain things that are adjacent to what is exists right now. So I can't be, you know, on the other side of the thing. It's going to take me time. It's going to take some, what's adjacent to me is this. You know, I can get closer to the coffee thing, pay coffee vendor. But I can't instantly go there. I have to go through adjacent possible points. So that's the adjacent possible. Now, at some once you cross, this is the the Rubicon. If you know that idea, yeah. uh, this is the Rubicon of possibility. Once you cross that point into the adjacent possible, some things are implied by that. That, like like these things, at some point are improbable. Maybe later. And then eventually you have, you know, there's a, there's a progression there. Okay, so we're gonna, there, I actually have about four different examples. We're only gonna go through one so we can get to the Q&A sooner. Um, you know, in my book that's coming out in October, we'll go into a little more detail. Um, so we're gonna think about transportation. We have a nice couple on horses that look very French um, from 18, actually when I go to the next one, I'll know what year it was. So this is about 1813. <laughs> Mode of transportation is horses. In 1814, someone invented the first self-propelled mechanical device for transportation. Now what that means is when that was invented, when that came into existence, that implied that improbably, but maybe later, there could be another version. And this is actually the first automobile. This was on rails. This is able to you know, steer and go other places. Um, but one of the whoops, one of the improbable, but at this point was impossible. But once this Rubicon was crossed, became improbable. Was flight. Wilhelm Orville used an engine to move that thing forward, and then also implied in that was the uh, space. Vehicle. It's just a matter of moving things, right? So I could go through examples of this. So, so literally in in the field of technology, um, and we can do the computing example. Going through, you know, for gazillions of years, we used our fingers or abacus, which are non. They weren't uh, doing the calculations for you. But then once, um, oh shoot, I forgot his name. I used to have a printed set of notes, but they didn't come with me. Um, in 1642, was it Pascal? Is that possible? But anyway. One of these brilliant guys whose name you'd recognize if I knew it, um, invented this machine that actually does the calculations for you. Well, that implied all this other stuff. It was Pascal? Okay. So, uh, and then we can talk about the example of medicine. Um, 
1845, it was all miasma, but in 1846, once uh, Ignaz Semmelweis did uh, hand washing, you know, things happen. I'm, I'm not going to go into those examples because that would bog me down. We want to get those books. But we do need to talk about education. <laughs> so that's what we're here for. So the actual now, at some point in the past, the actual now was, uh, this is from a book uh, that talks about how basically the, the form of the classroom we have is literally thousands of years old. 2000 BC is what's recognized as the first classroom uh, from archaeological evidence. Uh, but it looks identical to 1900. You know, I mean, not identical, but very close. Rows, people in class. Well, in 1907, and y'all might not know this because we're at Summerhill, which is here. <laughs> in 1907, in uh, Alpharetta, Georgia, or wait, maybe it's Alabama. Anyway, there's a school that John Dewey recognized in one of his books that still exists today. It claims it's democratic, though that's varied through the years. Uh, but it is older than Summerhill, even though it... Uh, but that's uh, Marietta Johnson's School of Organic Education. Um, so once she invented her school, and there's probably actually a better example somewhere in the past that doesn't exist anymore, um, but I don't know that because it doesn't exist. Um, but once this Rubicon was crossed, and and then Summerhill and things like that, once that, what is it that is that thing that was impossible that we're trying to create? We've already crossed this Rubicon, so it's not impossible, it's just improbable. <coughs> The rest of the talk is basically going to be talking about, okay, how do we get there? Um, so, so my way of thinking about it is focusing on creative, innovative schools hasn't actually gotten us very far. I mean, we've, we've done a great job. We've got what we've got here right now. But it's not enough. Um, what you probably cannot see because of the contrast um, is that I list holistic, what I consider holistic schools, which at the top is Democratic Schools, Agile Learning Center, Sudbury, Montessori, Waldorf, etc. Um, I, I created this slide not with you in mind. I created it with a broader audience because you accept that. Um, but there's also these things that you may not be aware of because we're in this bubble. Um, that there's things like High Tech High, Big Picture Learning, Epic Elementary, Iowa Big, Barter College, and I could, there's a list of literally hundreds of schools uh, in, mainly in the U.S. that are being studied. Uh, they've gotten grant money and they're studying. It's called the Deeper Learning Canopy. Um, so there's models that create a continuum from we're the extreme here, and there's this continuum across to the mainstream over here. And what my work has been is going and discovering what's in that continuum. Um, so now we're going to talk about what kind of market does education actually have. Um, and the, what I want to do is point to Michael Lewis's work. So if you've heard of the big short uh, movie, uh, book and movie, um, quite good. Uh, the Blind Side, which is about a football player. The, the big short is about the uh, 2008 uh, economic crash um, and how there's a bunch of people that made a ton of money betting against the market and when it crashed, they won. Um, but that was a market transformation, and that's the point. Is the blind side is about football um, and, and how there's this position called the left tackle. I'm not going to go into it. You're not sports people, or some of you probably are. Um, but that particular position was became very valuable at a certain point. That was a market transformation. The one I want to focus on, Marco Lewis, is Marco Lewis is a, is a financial report journalist. And his, most of it, well, many of his books focus on some kind of market transformation. Why did the market transform in 2008, in the 90s, I think it was, some of his early books, um, the football, uh, things like that. There was market dysfunction, where some assets were undervalued, other assets were overvalued, and then there's a market correction. The assets get more realistic pricing. So the one I want to focus on is called Moneyball, a uh, movie with Brad Pitt, and I forget his name. Um, it's about how um, in the game of baseball, which is the American, well, actually it's in Japan now too, it's quite popular there. Um, there was a, I think I have, okay, so this is the real life people. This is Billy Bean, who is the manager of the Oakland A's, which in the... 
overall market of, of uh, you know the Major League Baseball in America, they were one of the poorest teams. And in baseball, being poor versus being rich is a big deal. It makes a difference to how you can hire players, managers, etc. In football, it's different. The teams actually control the market so that they're more evenly, budget-wise, they're more evenly matched. Um, but he's a, one of the poorest teams, and he had this guy, Paul De Podesta, who is an economist. He said, uh, the whole book goes into how this happened, but basically, he's saying, there's this idea that if you, uh, here it is, here. Um, the, the dominant way that players are, are hired is, well, if you get a lot of, you have a high batting average and you hit a lot of home runs, then you're valuable, okay? And what they were recognizing, what Paul, Paul De Potesta was recognizing is that that's not the best way to win games. That's not the best way, that, that's not, not an accurate valuation of, of players. So part of what they were doing, one of the reasons baseball is a good example or, or is, is to use is because or, or the obvious example is it's one of the most um, quantified games in the world. Is there are more statistics about baseball than about anything else, and there's people who are obsessed with studying those statistics. So the question is, what data will help us win? The assumption had been for many you know, decades since the beginning of the game that batting average and home runs were the big ticket items. What um, Paul De Potesto was saying was like, no. There's this other thing, and, and uh, there, there's, so this is a baseball diamond. There's home plate, that's where the batter stands, and they're going to hit. And the, in order to get a run, in order to score points, you have to be a hitter and hit, get someone. You have to run around the bases and, and score. So on base is, when you're at bat, how many times do you get on base? It doesn't matter where you end up, but how many times do you get on? And then what they call slugging percentage is how far did you go once you got the hit that's going to get you on base. They just said that's a much more valuable data to know whether you're being successful. And what happened was in just one or two seasons, Billy Bean went almost but not quite to the World Series. And he was beating all the high paying teams. So he did something that was not supposed to happen. And, and he caught the movie is quite entertaining about how this played out uh, because everybody in baseball said, you're nuts, you're crazy. This is, and his fans talk about people getting heated and debating each other and, and bad mouthing him and this whole thing, you know. So it's a hype because there's millions of dollars at stake so, and, and people's pride and whatever. Um, so once he shows through an amazing, like the longest winning streak in baseball history, for instance, like people went, wait a minute, <laughs> he's onto something. And that's what's called a market correction, because all of a sudden those people with those different statistics were getting paid a lot more money. Now that negated Billy Bean's advantage. So the fact that he did so well was because he initiated a market correction. Okay, now let's turn to education. What is the market we're talking about? We here know for a fact that there is a market dysfunction. The question is, what data will help us to educate? Right now, the market dysfunction is that what I call academic bookkeeping. Test scores, grades, diplomas, certificates, whatever you want to call it academic data is supposed to be the big ticket item. That's what we want. We have an achievement gap because that's what matters. Achievement, not really achievement, just academic bookkeeping. If you get the grades, then you're on to college. And the college is supposed to be the big ticket, you know, to, to happy, prosperous life. But we all know that that's a market dysfunction. So the question is, we know that academic data is not going to do it, but what data will? A market for data. That's what I'm talking about. Baseball has a market for data too. They have real economic things going on in addition to that, but they have a market in data. So, this is an interesting question. What I argue is that what I call experiential climate data 
is the main thing that we need in order to correct this market. Now, you have no idea what I mean by experiential climate data. I'm a psychologist. Um, I study motivation and engagement. Uh, my thesis research was on the Village Preschool and the Village Home Education Resource Center, both located in Portland, Oregon. And my research was published in the journal Other Education, which is focused on our kind of school. That's what they do. It's an academic journal devoted to us and the people adjacent to us. So, because I know that psychologists like me can collect data on intrinsic motivation, and you claim that your schools support intrinsic motivation, prove it with data. I suggest that that is how to produce the market transformation we need. We cannot simply say to them, your data is invalid. They're not going to buy it. They're not going to change under that argument. However, we can say we have this other kind of data. It has 50 years of science behind it. Science which you're probably not familiar with, but that I've been studying for 10 years. That data says that motivation and engagement, and particularly psychological need satisfaction, are more important than any academic bookkeeping that may come later in the educative process. If you can show, if I can show that these kids, like take a classroom, whatever they do on a normal basis, every day, it could be in normal classroom terms, it'd be like, why do you raise your hand in class? Why do you do homework? Why do you do those things? If you can show that they do it for intrinsic reasons, great. Go to town, that academic data that you produce from that is going to be great. However, if their motivations are external, more external than internal, then you've got a problem. You've got compromise. Your academic data is compromised by the motivational pattern that produced that. It's a confounding factor in scientific, more scientific terms. So if you can, so, so what we do is we say, engagement and motivation are the pri prior condition for good academic data. We're not saying get rid of, I'm not saying get rid of academic data. Academic data is just fine. But show prior to that, that in fact you're educating kids in a way that supports their psychological needs, motivates them more internally than externally, and engages them in an agentic way. Those are all technical terms. So, that data is not being collected. You're not collecting it. Neither is the mainstream. That's a problem. My uh, a suggestion is that until we have some data to compete with their data in the market for data that is education, we're not going to make the kind of transformative change that is needed. Okay. Remember the canvassing problem? Part of the reason I can't go out and raise money for educated, democratic education is no one knows what the hell I'm talking about. Okay? I also, as someone who's been in politics, I can't go to a politician and talk about democratic education. I can't talk about the data I just explained to you. It would make no sense to them. So I believe that it's incumbent on us who are doing the good work to start collecting that data. My study 10 years ago of the Village Free School and the Village Home Education Research is just a teeny piece. Okay, it's not enough to make convince anybody of anything. And in fact, what this is not an unusual pattern is practice, what y'all did already, typically is prior to the theorization behind them. So that, that's not a bad thing. But now we need to catch up and say, okay, let's compete in the data market and produce the data that makes our case for us and shows them, because there's already you know, rafts of data showing that their intrinsic motivation declines both within and across years in the mainstream. They've already got the negative, we've already established the negative case against what the mainstream is, but we have no data on the positive case that there's something different that needs to happen. Okay. In order to overcome the canvassing problem, part of what we need to do is overcome a conceptual change problem. 
they can't think about democratic education and psychological needs and motivation because the way that they conceive of education is about content delivery. Just deliver it, motivation is irrelevant. So that's a problem. So let's think about conceptual change. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Uh, thinking about the change from miasma theory to germ theory. In the 1860s, hospitals were declared to be more dangerous than battlefields. You were uh, 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 a national part. I think it was actually a UK report. Um, yeah, it was Lord something or other who, who said the patient in an English hospital is more likely to die than a than a soldier on the battlefield of Waterloo. Florence Nightingale produced the most amazing statistical pie charts for that period. Exactly, exactly. Um, so when Florence Nightingale was doing her thing and doing brilliant work, um, one, she did not understand what she was doing. She was a miasmist. She was not into germ theory. Um, so what I'm building here, I'm building another way to think about things, is the danger in hospitals. Oh, look, I have a friend. Uh, the danger in hospitals produced what, what I call a moral punch. They had a sense something's wrong there but they could not figure out how to solve that problem because they didn't have any accurate ways to think about it. They just had a moral punch. Something's wrong. Then, at some later point, particularly in the 1870s, so in the 1860s, uh, like there, there was prior work that's very important, that was crucial to what Lister accomplished, but like uh, John Snow in London studying the, the cholera epidemic, the what's called the ghost map, you know, he produced great data, and he thought there was something in the water that caused the problem, but he didn't have what we now recognize as germ theory. And no one believed him. He got laughed out of the profession. Ignaz Semmelweis, who produced the hand-washing thing, he died in a sanatorium of an infection that could have been prevented had they washed their hands. Okay. Ironic. Tragically ironic. So Lister in the 1870s developed the theory that we now call germ theory, the idea that there's something there that actually harms us. But the theory did not produce any meaningful change. The scientists were starting to get it, but hospitals did not change their operations. Uh, in 1910, so, so a theory is what I call internal coherence. Uh, I actually have another example we'll go through where it's not a specific theory as, as specific as this, but it's still what I call internal coherence. In 1910 in the US, there was a thing called the Flexner Report. Um, U.S. Congress was realizing that, uh, that science was a thing. This is a really good, you know, good stuff. Why are people still dying in hospitals the way they were? Um, they sent a guy around named Flexner who went to all the medical education facilities in the country, produced a voluminous report, and said basically, no one, uh, very few of these schools are teaching science. They're apprenticeships, and they're there's, you know, what we would recognize as very alternative models of doing education. Um, but science needs to be based on the developing science of biology. They need to recognize the basic science. The Flexner Report, because it was actually authorized by the U.S. Congress, because the study was authorized by the U.S. Congress, then they took, they, they um, basically took over oversight of medical education. So the um, the allopathy, the osteopathy, you know, all the opathies that were going on, they on, they only started to recognize the ones who were teaching science, and they set standards and they did all kinds of things. So medical education was transformed, um, but it took many years. Uh, Actually, there's a whole book about the, this history. Um, it took basically until the 1940s before hospitals actually started uh, not killing people uh, as, as much as they did. Because by then, a generation of doctors had been trained scientifically under the idea of germ theory. So it took decades to get there. Now, in 2010, smallpox was eradicated. And in 1977, Rinderpest was eradicated. So, oh, so, so when the Flexner Report is basically what I call external coherence. Um, what that means is, so internal coherence means that all the specialists get it. 
but it's not really going out beyond the specialist. External coherence is when we can make a coherent political demand for change. And that's essentially what Flexner did. He said, this is not operating correctly. We need to fix it. And here's how we do that. It's an external. So the, there were people who opposed it. You know, People didn't like their schools being shut down for not teaching science. Uh, surprise. Uh, but that was what happened. Uh, it was yeah. okay, uh, and then and then so so this is a developmental progression. You cannot have these later's without the former. Without the moral hunch, no one cares to produce the internal coherence. And without the internal coherence, you're never going to get a coherent political demand. And without the inherent political demand, you're not going to get a pervasive social fact. So uh, germ theory. These are germs. They were literally wiped from the face of the earth. Well, they're preserved in labs, but you know what I mean. It's not found in the wild. And this has required global institutional efforts. They could not do that without these prior events happening. So in environmentalism, my own field in which I worked for many years, um, we're going to go through this faster because now you understand the model. Uh, the moral hunch, uh, I point to John Muir, who founded, who, he was instrumental in the foundation and the creating of national parks in the United States, the first national parks. Uh, but sometime after that, he realized, oh, wait a minute, the national parks aren't, there's too many political interests that are using the old idea that nature is just a resource to be exploited. We, he was fighting for what might be you know, a sacredness to nature. We need to preserve it for its own sake. Um, so he had the moral hunch. And there were a number of writers and things in that time that, that expressed the moral hunch. I just used him because he was actually instrumental in doing things about it. Uh, the Sierra Club being a key uh, move. Um, in the 1950s, the environmental movement reached internal coherence when uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was suddenly a bestseller. Um, deep Ecology, which I, uh, people may not be familiar with, but Deep Ecology is a, a t taking, holding the baton that, that John Muir passed, saying there is something sacred in nature, we need to really think about it thoroughly and, 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 and preserve it for its own sake. Um, so that was being developed by the 1950s. I, I, my uh, idea is that the external coherence can be so, what thought to have occurred once we had the, this is the uh, Earth from the Moon, Earth Rise over the Moon from 1970, I actually think that was a little earlier, um, but in, I think that was 1968. Um, but in 1970, uh, interestingly, Richard Nixon established the United States Environmental Protection Agency and Earth Day was, a, he had nothing to do with Earth Day, but then Earth Day was also established the same year. So that's what I would call external coherence. The, the environmental movement now, everybody, at least in the United States and probably many other places, suddenly goes, oh, there's this thing, there's these people. They're doing this thing, they're against pollution, they're against, you know, we can start to list all the things that are now kind of common sense. Like even the people who oppose it understand what you're talking about. They understand, when I say, you have a moment to talk about air pollution, everybody knows that I'm not representing industry. They know that I'm on the other side. We wouldn't bring it up otherwise. Um, so there's a number of assumptions that we make when we encounter environmentalism. We recognize, oh, okay, you probably like her. Oh, that's true, I do. <laughs> um, and now it's still ongoing. It's not a pervasive social fact. Climate change tells us that it's not a pervasive social fact, and the opposition to any measures to mitigate climate change tells us it's not a pervasive social fact. So we're not there yet environmentally. We've got some, some work to do still. If you support it, we can be better. Okay, so education. Where are we now? So my argument is that we've got the moral hunch. That's why you did what you did. You did what you did because you had the moral hunch. You said, I gotta do something about this, and you took action. You did what you could do. Uh, so I've got uh, Meredith Johnson, John Dewey, Democracy and Education, Summerhill, yeah. uh, uh, Press Hill, which is in Australia, which I list because it was listed on Arrow's alternative list at some point. In 1931, we've got John Holt, A.S. Uh, Neal. Uh, this is the school in Nepal. Uh, I forget what it's called now. 
would have been in my head. And then John Taylor got us there. So we've got the Merle Hunch down. We've got books, we've got schools, we've got all kinds of things to express our concern about this moral punch. Things need to be different. And, and not just trivially different, like we have a deep felt sense that this is wrong. It's not just a little bit off, it's like it's wrong. It's harming to us. And I think we are not, this is our rubric. The, the jump from moral hunch to internal coherence. The fact that I could list a whole set of schools that are not here and represented at a different conference that doesn't know our conference exists is the fact that we do not have internal coherence. They're natural allies to us because they largely believe the same things. In fact, they were inspired by some of our schools, but they don't know our conferences, they don't know our terminology, they don't know these things. And I know because I've been to their conferences. I've been going... Oh, I'm speaking specifically right now in my mind is the Deeper Learning Conference in San Diego run by uh, Tai Tech Han. I've gone there a couple times now. Um, I talk about you know, democratic education. Joyce was at the last one with me. Um, and am I right? They, amazingly, they may have heard of Summerhill maybe or Sudbury. They have no clue how it actually works. Uh, they don't know our language. They don't understand what we're doing. And yet they're doing things that sound similar and kind of move in this direction. Um, okay, so so my argument is we don't yet have internal coherence. Um, oh, and these are some lists. This is the same list of schools, but this is like uh, Comer schools, something started in the, in the 1968 or so. Rights Respecting Schools, that's a UN initiative. That Does anybody know Rights Respecting Schools? Okay. See? <laughs> my point! You don't know that the UN has a whole set of... Uh, of what? Yes, it should be. <laughs> now, the UN, it, it actually started in the UK. Um, they're going around to the mainstream schools and saying, you have to have student representation when decisions are made. You have to, you know, they have a whole list of things. And they give out awards to the schools as they go through this process of establishing what we would consider obvious practices. But the UN, uh, I'm sorry, not, not the UN. Uh, what's the UN trial? Uh, UNICEF. UNICEF. Be more accurate. UNICEF has this great program. Now that's the program that they have for developed countries. They also have a program for developing countries, which is like you have to educate the girls, you have to feed the children, so you know, more basic. Uh, but similarly, they have two great programs that I don't think anybody here knows. Um, and then there's these are just like this. Edutopia is a. a, 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 a online, I think they actually had a published magazine at some point, but I think it was just an online distribution of articles about cool things in education, um, what schools could be, that Ted Dinter Smith, who uh, made the movie um, Most Likely to Succeed, um, features high tech five prominently, things like that, uh, and Education Reimagined, which is an organization that talks about developing an ecology of learning and learner-centered, not student-centered, learner-centered, so you can include the teachers in that, I think that's very important. Anyway, so there's all kinds of things that many people here you don't know about. I've been actually seeking it out, and so I find it. <laughs> um, but since they do not know about us at all, and they're our natural allies politically, it's, it's odd that we don't. That, to me, just speaks volumes that we do not yet have internal coherence. To that end, I wrote a book. <laughs> Um, it's called Schooling for Holistic Equity. Um, I do not claim that it provides internal coherence. That's actually up to the world to decide. Um, but it's my contribution towards that end. Because that's, I think, what we most need, and that's what I could contribute. Um, it'll be coming out on October 5th. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can achieve internal coherence shortly. Um, but I'm also looking towards how do we establish external coherence and the market correction. Because um, we can start these processes now, because we're all, we have already figured things out. So we need that data um, to begin the process of, of engaging that uh, correction in the market, uh, start to lay the groundwork for that to actually happen. Okay, now the final piece is the change agents. Who's gonna, who can do these things? How does it get done? So remember these guys from the baseball thing? This is Paul, he's the economist, he's the, the coach of the team. It wasn't their idea. They had actually, there was a guy in the 1970s who was a baseball statistics fanatic and, and economist who actually came up with the idea in 1977. 
So the fact is, this idea that completely transformed the market was not brought forward by the person who came up with the idea. A different set of circumstances had to happen. What basically had to happen was Billy Bean. Someone in a position to do something with that data at the level that it could transform the market. And so this is the tricky bit. This is a bit I have no real idea how it's going to happen. But at some point, if we set the stage properly, someone's going to come along in the right position of power and say, wait, that data's really good. Let's use it. And well, I don't know what they're going to do with it, but it's going to be in some school system. And they're going to say, yeah, yeah, when we do this, we'll get you know better outcomes. We'll get better, you know, more equity, which is why my book's called Holistic Equity. Um, but it's not the people who necessarily come up with things that make it go that next stage. Another example of that is McDonald's, which everyone creams, I'm sure. McDonald's as an example? Ooh. <laughs> but the fact is that Ray Kroc turned McDonald's from a single restaurant into a global thing. Now, he did it in probably unethical, maybe even illegal, but nobody's prosecuted him. He's dead now, so it's not past. <laughs> Too late. Um, but from 1940 to 1953, for 13 years, the McDonald's brothers were doing their thing. And they made it a super, you know, it, it was an innovative restaurant for its time. And it, he had all sorts of efficiencies built in. And they actually were trying to produce good food. They believed in food, not an efficient franchise. Ray Kroc came in. He was actually a milkshake salesman, a uh, milkshake maker salesman. And said, wow, this is really cool. And then within a few years, they hired him. And then he took over the business. And he kicked them out and cheated them out of lots of money. Well, he didn't like be too strong, but who knows. Um, but what he did was he took somebody else's idea and transformed it. And he transformed markets and things like that in the process. And I don't know how many of you know, but at some point in the past, Ray Kroc was asked, what is McDonald's? And the answer is not a hamburger company. It's a real estate company. Yeah. He realized that what he had been doing with franchisees was the ones that succeeded were on these prime real estate lots. And so they, part of their franchise thing was, we'll buy the lot, you can run the franchise on it, and then they continue to own that lot. And even that that franchisee goes out of business and somebody else wants that to use that property, McDonald's owns it, and so they get it, lease it from McDonald's. So McDonald's actually was the largest land-holding organization in the world at one point, I think in the 90s. Uh, I don't think that's, that may not be true anymore. But the point is not about McDonald's and, and Ray Kroc specifically. It's about there has to be someone in a position to, tra to take an idea and do something more with it. And we haven't experienced that yet. And I'm not sure if it requires, it may require us to achieve internal coherence, get things you know, moving in a certain direction, and then somebody comes along and goes hog wild. Um, but at some point, there has to be some, when we talk about scalability or sustainability, that's going to have to happen. It may not look like a single organization doing it. It may look like all of us. But some change has to happen, and that's the market correction, I think, is a key first step. Okay, so how can we navigate our adjacent possible to move in this direction? Okay, that's essentially the end of my talk. Thank you very much.